and this is a very very important aspect and because we have state of art instrumentation with 24 bit digitizers we can be picking up anywhere um, uh, very small uh, motion to a large motion of ground displacement so the spectral signatures if you take this seismogram the time series and take its spectrum the signatures of turbulent flow induced that is the turbulent flow spectral signature and the bed load induced forces that is the bed load and the water when it is for flowing and the drag which is created at the river bed are significant enough and these two processes can be characterized independently using seismic records acquired at various distances from the river and this is forming a very very important component globally using this physics based signatures to design early warning systems and incidentally which i am now going to show the results in the coming few minutes is the culmination of a seismological network which is being operated by CSIR and GRI, that is National Geophysical Research Institute Hyderabad in Uttarakhand had helped us to map the Dauli Ganga catastrophe which has happened in Chamundi district. Now, when you look at the physical model for seismic noise generation by turbulent flow in rivers, if you think if you consider uh, this as one grain or a boulder of a different size. There are two forces which are going to act on this. That is the average force resulting from the contribution of all stresses applied to this given grain is commonly described as a combination of the average drag force, that is the drag which is happening when the grain is being moved by the water and the average lift force. So that means there is a buoyancy also and the particle moves up. So these are the two major forces and they are contributing to the stresses applying onto the grain and thereby that is dictating the drag force as well as the bed load force and the velocity of the particles in turn creating a chaotic situation of a turbulent flow and in the riverbed. So this is the first paper which appeared in Journal of Geophysical Research in 2014 where physics based mathematically simulated equations were created to see why seismic noise is being recorded I, uh, on, uh, on the banks of the rivers by the seismometers and how we can interpret in terms of a physical process of a flood or uh, thereby other aspects which, which do follow when such catastrophic events happen. So if we now go to the Dauli Ganga flood which occurred, um, uh, you all know, in the month of February. Uh, this occurred with, uh, within the dense Uttarakhand network of 76 broadband stations which are being operated by the National Geophysical Research Institute with an interstation uh, spacing anywhere between 18 kilometers and an average sometimes less than uh, 18 kilometers, that is plus or minus 7 kilometers. And this has been set up under the Focus Basic Research Project and the Mission Mode save, uh, Project of the Council of Scientific Industrial Research to look at the safety and the security of the vital installations, which this network was uh, installed in 2018. And the beauty of this network is it doesn't, it doesn't, it not only has the velocity meters, which I talked about the size broadband seismometers, but also strengthened by another 35 accelerometers in the event of a large earthquake happening, we would be recording the ground motion of the large earthquake without the uh, without the seismic signal getting saturated. Whereas in the velocity meters, they do get saturated, saturated if the seismometers are in close proximity, even for a six magnitude earthquake. So this event which had happened in Dauli Ganga flood, it created a lot of uh, material which had slipped steep north face of Ronti Peak that was about 27 into this cubic meters into 106 cubic meters of rock and glacier ice collapse from the steep north face of Ron Ronti Peak. 80% was rock and 20% was ice. The signals were observed up to 100 kilometers that the seismic signals, the, the carving that is the sliding and the impact on the riverbed signals which were created 
were observed up to 100 kilometers from the disaster. And this demonstrates the potential for these faraway monitoring stations, which can be used for early warning. Why do I say so? The unfortunate part of this happened was quite a number of people lost their lives who were working on the hydropower plants, especially which are being constructed and the sliding. And by the time it came and started uh, uh, hitting this, I mean, striking these power plants, there was a time lapse of over 10, 10 to 20 minutes. And this would have saved, if the warning would have been given, this could have saved these precious lives. So, CSR and GRI in collaboration with the Geo Fushung Zentrum um, uh, Potsdam, this is a geophysical institute, we are now planning to have an early warning system using this network and further strengthening to now provide warning, early warning to flash floods or such glacial cave carvings, which is correct, beautifully demonstrated, which I will be showing in the following slides, how beautifully this network had helped in trying to understand the physics of the process as well as the velocity with which these debris flow had flown from point A to point B. The seismic signal of the rock slide impact phase one registered throughout the Uttarakhand network. That means both in Kumau, Kumau Himalayas and Garhwal Himalayas, actually this event happened in Garhwal Himalayas, with a signal noise ratio of about 10 dB in the frequency range of 1 to 2.5 hertz. This is a high frequency where 1 to 2.5 hertz, where the seismometers have the natural frequency of recording these frequencies. Hence, they provided a robust detection in picking up the signal. The impact was also clearly visible in the frequencies below 1 hertz and in the far field, for example, at stations which were located at more than six, between 600 kilometers to 1000 kilometers. And what are those? Kathmandu at 625, Islamabad at 725 and Kabul at 1090 kilometers. So that is the power and you can imagine the amount of energy which was released when this material of 27 into 106, uh, 10, to the power of this 10 to the power of 6 cubic meters of rock which came and struck this. So where did this event happen? This happened in a place called Ronti Peak where the actual uh, glacier as well as rock sliding it happened and this is where the Rishi Ganga uh, power project uh, hydropower project is existing and this is the, the top of one hydro hydropower project which is existing so these are all uh, quite far away I mean far away in the sense um, that they're far away uh, from where the event had happened and if you look at the pre and the post event satellite pictures the pre that is in B and C and D, you can very clearly see that in the B, there is there is this small crack which has begun and it is expanding. And in D, that is January 1, 10, that is 2021. This is the satellite imagery of February 5, 2021. And on February 10, 2021, you can clearly see that the entire glacier as well as a rock mass has slid and which is about 500 meters in length. And if you can look 20 meters of glacier ice, which is there, 550, uh, 180 meters into 550 meters is the rock. And it fell from 5,500 meters to about 5,000 meters. So there was a rock fall of 500 meters. And you can imagine what kind of um, uh, impact it would have created because of this huge mass of material which slid and fell down on the ground. So to give more about a demonstration, the initial landslide 26.9 cubic millimeters, cubic million, million meters of uh, mass fell down, 80% of rock and 20% of ice. So it fell down while falling because of the heat which is being created uh, while the sliding is happen, happening, the fragmentation and the melting of ice starts. And once it hits the ground, so the run up onto the opposite slope does happen. And then the possible entrainment and injection of water from valley sediment starts. Splashing of mud and water begins. Entrainment and liquefaction of, uh, of snow is happening. And the rock ice avalanche, all these have started forming at uh, a given point of time. 
and then the water rich front escapes as debris flows and the deposition of solid material is entrenched and then what happens you have first hit the rishiganga hydropower plant power project and then the tapovan hydropower project so this is the flow direction the the gray ones are the rock de de debris the violet ones dots filled in dots are the ice and the filled in dots which are blue in color is water so now you can imagine so it is a combination and our agglomeration of rock debris ice and water all flowing at jet speeds so what you can see is that five different locations they have mapped the trim lines and the velocities at which this water was flowing this paper appeared in uh, science uh, cited it which is by sugar and a lot of indians are involved in it and you can also see how much of rock and ice and everything started flowing it started flowing at 60 meters per second almost on 50 meters per second velocity by the time it comes to 0.4 that is p4 the velocity decreases to 10 meters per second so it was coming at tremendous speed and what you can see the yellow one is the rock fraction the rock fraction is the maximum you have the ice fraction which is very less and the fluid fraction which increases as you are moving away from the impact that means you are taking the water and the fluid is being injected out and striking both the power plants with the debris which had happened so so this is what uh, we can see that the debris started flowing at great speeds and if you would like to see these uh, satellite imageries this is the september 30 2017 this is the Ronti Ghat, this is the Rishi Ganga, and the Dauli Ganga comes from, <clears throat> sorry. From the other side, this is the 50, February 1, February 19, 2021. You can see the deposition and the damming of the river had happened. And this is the Rishi Ganga, which is filled with debris <coughs> and the rock mass on this. On February 1, 2017, the hydro, Tapovan hydropower site was under construction. And you can see how it looks like. And February 10, 2021, the entire Tapovan hydropower site has been deposited with debris and rock and other silt and other material. And this has become more or less a, a graveyard like thing uh, because of this catastrophic event which came in hand. These are the 76 stations which we are operating. And this is exactly where the 7th February avalanche or landslide happened. And when you look at the seismograms at the different stations which we have uh, within within the network in Uttarakhand, uh, you can see very clearly that uh, the event is recorded. But the biggest challenge what we had here was to isolate the signal of an earthquake, which was from Philippines, which happened, which started uh, some time before. We needed to remove that signal and uh, we had to compare the spectral signatures at Hyderabad Broadband Seismic Station and you can very pretty well see that you only have surface waves with not much amplitude but whereas in the station at Ransi that these surface waves are overladen with high frequency waves which are very much uh, what you call coinciding with the impact and then the debris flow and uh, if you try to take this and uh, filter uh, the seismograms of the vertical components at uh, 0.1 hertz that at 10 seconds. This is Masuri, this is Karnaprayag, this is Devprayag, this is uh, Triyugnarayan, this is Agastamani, this is Auli, and they have a host of stations. And how do you, Auli happen to be the closest to this event? So the ma major initiation of the process is very well picked up, the impact, followed by different flow flood flows which had happened are marked very clearly indeed you would see four events which is which are very much seen on the seismograms and <clears throat> this is the displacement seismogram which we had to pick pick that up especially uh, the fall of that uh, 29 cubic million kilometers of material which fell <clears throat> onto the ground about 500 meters so we had to model for this and see how the detachment plane looks like and we took the seismograms at Auli and uh, GDM. This is the spectrogram of the Auli station 
and the lower hemisphere projections of a single force focal sphere that means the detachment force and the orientation of whether it's upward or downwards we want to see and very clearly we can see the detachment happen in the downward plane which is very clearly shown by the seismograms the black represents the data displacement and the filtered seismograms are between 0.08 to 0.15 hertz and uh, you can very clearly see how you have the river gauges which is at joshima yellow in color the hydropower sites are plotted in green color the tapo one and the rishi ganga the flow location at uh, different timings are seen and uh, um, uh, synthesized on the uh, synthesized and modeled which we see those phases on the seismograms and the seismic station location is this auli so this was about 25 kilometers away from where to the southeast of the auli station where this uh, event happened and if you look at the probability spectral density function of the seismogram you can very clearly see the rock slide the, there is a high energy which you can particularly see the greater the uh, the red the color the more the energy is the power of the spectral energy is more and then we have the uh, what do you call it? the mass flow which is happening and then after 25 minutes almost or, or 15 to 20 minutes you do have the flood passing by the station and very clearly this was for about 10 to 15 minutes of uh, the flood was passing by the station and you can see the frequency content of that flood was anywhere between two to eight hertz two to eight hertz so the mass flow um, which you see is uh, almost all around one hertz to eight hertz but the flood is very is very strongly characterized anywhere between uh, two two to i mean two hertz to eight hertz so this is what is very important when you try to look at and uh, try to study this uh, energy content of this rock mass which fell down and the flow and this information which you can see at different stations which we could pick up the phase one phase two phase three and phase four of the different phases where the flood and the debris was flowing was very important for us now to envisage an early warning system being located in this region so that using the seismic signals and the frequency content of the energy of this flood um, of this uh, rock mass we want to, we we can now have an early warning system designed in this region and uh, we were also tracking the flow and the velocity at different locations uh, based on the seismic stations which we have so the rock slide almost all happened around 453 and then we started seeing how the flow front is happening these are all snapshots where it's based on amplitude and distance method that gives you the velocity where you can very clearly see how the flow front uh, was moving and by 516 uh, we could see it reached uh, quite quite a distance and the flow front uh, was mapped at uh, 528 at this pay, at this point so the rock slide sources again and again you can see the flow front uh, which from a different method we wanted to test and see what we are seeing is a fact is an artifact of modeling or is it a, is it a real value which we are getting and more or less the blue symbols what you see are the flow front locations which we have been obtained from the satellite imageries and very clearly what the satellite imageries had shown most more or less our flow fronts uh, which we have seen from our seismic uh, signals is reaching at the same point of time what the sat satellite imageries are mapped so and far field uh, rock slide detection very important this is the philippines earthquake which i said was a challenge for us to remove this energy because it had almost all <clears throat> right from uh, 10 seconds of uh, uh, se seismic noise up to two hertz we do find and very clearly it, it can be seen at Kathmandu station and this is the entire rock slide <clears throat> energy which you can see basically from one hertz to three hertz this is at Islamabad, there is a station called Nilor, and this data is available globally for anybody. And then you can also see the rock slide is very clearly seen, but with a different time shift in comparison to Kathmandu. And in the case of Kabul, though it is not as strong as uh, Islamabad or Kathmandu, but you can see still the trace of this up to 1000 kilometers. So this is the 
power spectral density, the power of the seismic energy, the amplitude spectrum, what you can try to get, and you try to study this. So conclusions are at frequencies smaller than 0.1 hertz, the signal generated by the landslide is contaminated by an earlier 6.1 earthquake in the Philippines. So that is the reason why we had to take bandpass filtering greater than 0.1 hertz, which more or less we know the seismic frequencies due to such kind of uh, river flood uh, or um, the catastrophic event of glacial carving is more than two hertz. So that signal could be picked up. The landslide consisted of several sub events seen as pulses in the recordings which I showed. The main pulse was preceded by a smaller one about 54 seconds earlier. It was followed by four pulses which could be tra traced at the almost all the stations in the Uttarakhand. The pulses were generated at nearly the same location and these pulses propagated at velocities at three kilometers per second. And the particle motion, that is very important. When you look at the seismogram, you have the P wave, you have the S wave. These are called the body waves. And then you have the rally waves and the love waves, which are called the surface waves. So more or less, when we looked at the particle motion of these waves, they are elliptical retrogrades, suggesting that they are rally waves which are generated because of the turbulent flow when the material is flowing, the surface waves are created. The transverse and radial ground motions have similar amplitude that a single vertical source will not be sufficient to model the observed seismograms. It will require a horizontal force as well. And exactly that is what I showed. You have to have a drag force as well as a lift force. And the satellite images show very clearly that 27.3 into 10 to the power of 6 cubic meters of landslide, which happened involved a rock volume of this amount, which is 80% and 20% glacier, fell 1200 meters and gives a potential energy of 8 into 10 to the power of 21 ergs. So that is the reason why this potential energy, which uh, has um, is, uh, is, is seen and converted into the kinetic, from kinetic energy to potential energy, we could see the radiated seismic energy of the main event, which is about 2 into 6, 2.6 into 10 to the power of 15 uh, uh, ergs. That means entirely it has not been converted. So there is a lot of energy loss which has happened. And the magnitude of this could be described as a 3.2 magnitude event. But a 3.2 magnitude event, if you had in Uttarakhand as an earthquake source, you could not be recording that at Kabul or anything. But this being, though the magnitude is less, but this radiated energy which is released and during the water flow, all put together gives you a fantastic analysis that which we can use it for an early warning system. Hopefully in two, three, two to three years, CSR and GRI, Geoforsung Centrum, Potsdam will be strengthening this network and an early warning system would be placed to forewarn people in the event of natural disasters like cloud burst, like glacial carving, like floods which are created over a period of time. And this would be uh, forming a very, very important component uh, for saving uh, the future of uh, the uh, citizens of Uttarakhand and uh, the Indian citizens especially and the others who go there as tourists. Thank you very much. This is exactly what I have to speak. So if you have any questions, I'm open to them. Thank you, sir, for such a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, Tipali, do we have any question in Q&A? Uh, yes, so one question we have. Uh, so the question is, are the hydropower projects a boon or bane for the environment? Uh, but the hydropower, achha, are they boon, uh, hydropower projects? Are boon or bane? Uh, Say it's a Hobson's choice. You can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't say uh, which is, uh, it's 50-50. See, they, what is re, uh, very important whenever a project of these sizes are built in, three or four aspects have to be considered. First, what is the environmental impact it is going to create, first of all. Second, what kind of hazards are going to impact on these hydropower projects? And indeed, this is what is very much uh, required. Most of the time, what we try to see is 
the hydrological events which are like rainfall and what could be the flood generated what is this impact assessment is done as well as the environmental impact assessment is done and earthquake hazard assessment is done but such kind of one of one events which are happening that needs to be looked in and this is much more increasing in the last few years or decade or decades is because of the climate change glacial carving is uh, was not frequent as what you now try to see happening at these places or elsewhere globally so we have to bear this in mind so that whenever a project is built in especially in such tectonically disturbed areas basically we are now in himalaya and tectonically disturbed areas what is important is the climate change effect because the tectonics drives you the uh, weather systems the tectonic also is responsible for the climate and the climate change and its impact is very very important to be looked at so for every boon there is a bane but what ratio it is one needs to see so natural disasters do happen and you can predict to a certain extent but still we have not understood the nature how it behaves and what can, what can happen at many times so this is one thing which we have all have to live and we will be seeing this extreme events happening much more and affecting all of us thank you sir for answering the question the one last question is after chamuli flood why chardham road project is still on or is in the spotlight after the chamun after this event which i am talking of this flood right yes, sir, yes, sir. Oh, so how do you find your ideal pardon me hello somebody was speaking um maybe someone mic's got on sir okay arupali ji please repeat the question sir question is after chamuli flood why the chardham project is still on or is in spotlight chardham project is uh, is the road connectivity right that is a totally different thing the flood is a totally different thing so the project is, we have to continue see one thing we cannot say that roads cannot be built roads are very important for any economic development and especially for uh, uh, for a country who, uh, who whose security is very important and we are uh, sharing borders with the different countries and how are you going to transport uh, your troops how are you going to transport uh, all your um, other uh, equipment ammunition and everything see we develop for development we need to have but in a scientific way this is very very important see all what we are now today discussing of this workshop is not that you will have a hands on experience of what it is you are being exposed to what are the possibilities of disasters which we, we cannot envisage and what are the methodologies and technologies which are involved this is the focus which we are trying to look in very very important is this see i'll give you a small example everybody gets afraid when the ground shakes we do not know what it is magnitude when a lightning happens you know there is a it is followed by a thunder and the thunderbolt can be just right by the side of your house and your doors and windows shake but you are not afraid because you know what is the cause the causative until you do not know the fear will linger upon us so that is very important and that is why i think uh, thanks to nidm for uh, having this workshop for the uh, university students thank you thank you so much uh, we are done with the question and answer round thank you so much sir for joining and giving a, such a wonderful presentation on this such topic thank you so much thank you. thank you thank you sir thank I, you so I, much thank you uh, venkatesh ji i have to travel so uh, please permit me to leave if you don't sure mind. sure sir thank you very kind thank you sir very kind thank you uh, aldar sir So after Thank this you, lecture, yeah, we have the second lecture by another distinguished scientist, Dr. Anirudh Unyal, who is <clears throat> not only a scientist but also a science communicator. And I like his lectures very much because he uses a lot of visuals and graphs, and you know, so he would be talking on the river bank erosion, very important topic. You know, a previous speaker was talking about the frictional force. due to turbulent water flow but that is also causing uh, you know the many uh, inundation of 
uh, villages across the river such as Sharda, just uh, today in the newspaper, there's one image that the last village washed away uh, uh, from the banks of the Sharda River in one of the stretch. So I welcome Dr. Anirudh Dunyal and I request Dipali to a uh, little bit read about his CV and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Sure, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Dr. Anirudh Unyal is an earth scientist and is working in the field of geosciences and disaster management for last 28 years and is presently head in uh, head at Earth Resources Division and Remote Sensing Applications Center, UP Lucknow. Previously, he has served in Haryana Space Application Center and Disaster Management Center. Dr. Unyal has more than 70 research papers and articles in the publications of Springer, Taylor & Francis, Emerald, Current Science Association, etc., and in various international and national seminars and symposiums, and he has written two books to, for his credit. He has been conferred with many awards for his contribution to science, popular science writing, and science poetry. Dr. Unyal has been involved in landside studies in Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, Darjeeling Hills, and Sikkim, and also been a member of NDMA Task Force for formulation of the National Landside Risk Management Strategy. With these words, I invite Dr. Onyal to kindly take over the stage and please address our audience. Thank you, sir. Over to you, Dr. Onyal. Uh, thank you, Dipali, ma'am. Uh, thank you, Professor Ventas uh, It's a, uh, Thank you, Haldar Saab. It's certainly a proud privilege uh, to be a part of this training. And uh, I thank BBAU and an IDM from the core of my heart for giving me an opportunity to be part of this uh, training. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you're audible. So uh, I am sharing my presentation. Uh, uh, are you able to see the presentation on the screen? Yes, sir, we are able to see. Uh, okay, thank you, sir. Uh, so today uh, we shall be discussing how best we can apply remote sensing in assessing river bank erosion, bank line shift, and channel ablation. Uh, remote sensing is like uh, uh, collecting information about an object or phenomena or surface feature of Earth without coming into its physical contact and. Uh, then our eyes to some extent do the same thing because we can see the objects or features with our eyes, then the question rises why remote sensing is required. Because our eyes or human eyes have certain limitations and beyond those our eyes can't see. Uh, so uh, remote sensing uh, can see through those regions of electromagnetic spectrum uh, through which our eyes can't see. Uh, so uh, this is one of the biggest advantage and like active remote sensing or radar sensing, it can be used to see even during night time. So this is one example on the screen, how remote sensing is being utilized uh, for uh, mapping rivers. And uh, this is actually the passive remote sensing, what we are seeing on the screen, wherein the surface feature of art, they are being illuminated with sunlight and some of the light is, uh, absorbed by the feature, some, or, uh, some part of it is reflected and it is reflected back to the sensor of the satellite. From there, it is downloaded in the form of image. And this image is processed on the computers using different uh, softwares, which are called image processing softwares. And once we process it, then this is on the lower right side is the final output in the form of map. <laughs> now, uh, some of the remote sensing platforms can be seen on the screen. Uh, can you uh, can you see on the screen this heading platforms? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> so we have mainly three types of platforms. Our first category of platforms is aerial platform. So uh, these are the oldest platforms probably, and it all begins sometimes in the mid of 19th century with the invention of camera, wherein at that time some uh, cameras used to be mounted uh, as an innovative way on uh, balloons to take images of a few houses or uh, some or that of a playground. That was uh, the time where remote sensing was in its infancy. It was during First World War, wherein 
uh, the navigators with pilot started manually clicking the um, picks of uh, enemy troops, their armor or their artillery regiments. Armor means their tank regiments and their artillery regiments, their infantry. And by Second World War, the current color photography was introduced and automated uh, aerial photography started wherein the started wherein the uh, navigator was not required. So uh, after Second World War, these aerial photographs, which were taken from aircrafts, they were used for flood management, for forest management, for land use mapping. And uh, in the beginning of uh, 70s, this satellite remote sensing also came into being uh, with the, the launch of Landsat series by USA. So with satellite, uh, with the introduction of satellite remote sensing, Earth's imaging was possible through a number of satellites. And at the same time, there was uh, there is another platform that is ground-based platform, wherein ground-based uh, sensors, like if they are mounted on a tripod or on a vehicle, they are also used for mapping. Now, the latest of the remote sensing technologies is drone or UAV remote sensing. Uh, where is UAV's unmanned aerial vehicle or US it is also called uh, where unmanned aerial system or uh, these systems are also being used nowadays as aerial platforms for uh, uh, taking images and uh, the drones have big advantage, huge advantage because they can go into narrow lanes uh, where there are multi-story buildings on, the, on the both sides they can take images of uh, rivers wherein they flow through gorges. So uh, even for microgeomorphology, for imaging of uh, the small features associated or landforms associated with, with the rivers, these drones can be used. And drone, the full form is of drone is dynamic remotely operated navigation equipment drone. So now these were the platforms. And these are the two major types of satellites. There is one another category of satellites. They are called defense satellites. I would not be discussing them. So uh, on my left side is a geosynchronous uh, satellite, which is placed at an orbit of about 36,000 kilometers above the surface of Earth, and it varies in the weight between 2.5 tons to 4 tons. So its uh, revolution of Earth is synchronized with the rotation of Earth. Means Earth completes one rotation about its axis in 24 hours <coughs> and uh, this uh, geostationary satellite also completes one revolution of Earth in about 24 hours. So it looks as if the satellite is stationary. Actually, it is not. <coughs> but uh, this satellite has wide applications. Uh, if we are watching a match from Dubai, one day international, then its transponders are being used. So it is used for telecommunication. If we are ringing up to someone of uh, uh, someone there in USA or in Japan, then its transponders are used. So this is again used for telecommunication. And when we see the images on Doordarshan in the evening, that while well, uh, thunderstorms are likely to occur in this part of India. So all those images, course images, they are taken for from its uh, sensors. So these satellites are used for TV transmission, telecommunication, and weather forecasting. Uh, then uh, on my right side is remote sensing satellite. This satellite weights around 1 ton or 1,000 kgs and it is placed in an orbit of around 550 to 900 kilometers above the surface of Earth. It is polar sun synchronous satellite as well because it is somehow synchronized uh, with the illumination of Earth uh, from the sun. So because these satellites are basically for passive remote sensing and uh, they uh, more or less go from north to south and 90 degree, except uh, 85 degree north to 90 degree north and 85 degree south to 90 degree south, entire Earth can be viewed through them. And they are able to complete one revolution of Earth in about uh, one, one and a half or about 100 minutes, 105 minutes. And they have the excellent revisit capability. We can see the same area after interval of every five days. And uh, if we can rotate their camera, uh, we can see even at a lesser interval. So now India is a country which has largest number of remote sensing satellites. So we have that revisit capability wherein we can see any area of our country within a span of maybe five days or even less than that. <clears throat> and I think this is an excellent tool for river mapping, for bank line shift mapping, 
for river channel also studies. Now, uh, once we talk, when we talk about uh, channel migration or bank line shift of rivers, what it is all about? Rivers generally move in two ways, and they have three stages. When river flows through hill regions, uh, it is in its uh, uh, early stage of uh, evolution, that is called youthful stage, when uh, it forms gorges, the valleys are narrow, uh, the valley walls are steeper, the channel is more or less straight, except in the areas which is tectonically controlled. <coughs> but when river enters from the hill regions to plain regions, the gradient changes and the flow, uh, the velocity also decreases, so the river is not capable of carrying that sediment, uh, and it somehow deposits it at the junction of hills and plains, and that is called the foot region of the hills or the pit bond zone. So there we see alluvial fans, a number of alluvial fans. If we see Ganga plain, we can see a number of alluvial fans uh, somewhere uh, where Yamuna enters into the plain areas from Uttarakhand to parts of uh, Himachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand. And then we can see alluvial fans in the western UP around Saharanpur, <laughs> Rurki, and in, even in Nazimabad, Pilibit. So, and even up to Devaria, Balrampur region, and further ahead, Gandak fans, we can see <coughs> in UP and uh, Bihar region, northern, uh, northeastern part of UP and uh, northwestern part of Bihar. So, then in alluvial fan regions, river, the channels are braided, and uh, means there are a number of bars formed within. And once they enter from this alluvial, uh, this, uh, alluvial fan region to the plain region, <laughs> there, River, the velocity of river further decreases, and this is how we can see these loops. They form a number of loops or bands, which are called <coughs> uh, meanders. Now, uh, this is uh, the mature stage of the river, where, where it is witnessing uh, meandering. And once the river reaches at, at its end stage, where it merges into the Bay of Bengal, Ganga and it, many of it, uh, Ganga and its tributaries. So uh, there, uh, you see, it is mastery stream in Ganga, is Ganga, all the rivers, they are merging into Ganga, and finally it is merging into <coughs> Bay of Bengal. So uh, there it forms delta. So that is the end stage. So now uh, this successive migration and channel inversion, it is a uh, peculiar phenomena in the mature stage, in all through Ganga plains, or in the largest perspective, indo gangetic plain, which comprises Ganga Plain in parts of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, and Bengal, Brahmaputra Plains in parts of Assam and Bangladesh, and Indus Plains, which are in parts of Punjab and Haryana. <coughs> so, uh, the migration of river takes place in two ways. Number is successive migration. Every year, the river is moving towards the convex side. Uh, and uh, <coughs> so, this movement is successive. It could be from few meters to few hundreds of meters a year, this is channel migration, what we are seeing on the left side. And, but then ch in channel migration, suddenly uh, the sinusity increases, and there is a stage when the channel becomes very sinus, and then suddenly it witnesses channel evolution, where the sinusity is high, the band is uh, very sinus, then during first the river acquires a straighter path. Those who are students or beginners, uh, in this field, I would just uh, cite one example. You just uh, uh, throw a glass of water at your floor, and then you will see that uh, if you uh, throw it with a force, it will flow in a straight line. So similar is the fate of rivers when there are floods. The water acquires shortest and straight path, <laughs> and in that case, the channel evolution takes place. This is a textbook example of channel evolution, wherein the meandering has taken place, and then during floods, the river has acquired this shorter path. So it could witness channel levels somewhere here because it has become very sinus <laughs> in this part. Here, remote sensing and GIS, these technologies prove to be excellent tools for monitoring it on a decadal scale. Where was river flowing some 10 years back or 20 years back or 30 years back and where it is flowing today? <laughs> and if there are floods, uh, maybe uh, if they were last year or before last year, so we can monitor them on a decadal scale or even on a scale of two years, three years, four years. We can monitor this uh, channel evolution as well as successive migration. <coughs> now, I would be giving some examples <laughs> of uh, this mapping, monitoring of bank erosion, bank lines here. This is one 
textbook example wherein we can see that this is Ganga River near Prayagraj. This is Prayagraj, earlier called Allahabad. So Ganga River was somewhere here near Fajula Foot Braze way back in 1973. And by 1999, it has uh, moved around two kilometers southwest direction and this direction is shown with this red arrow. So this mapping has been possible using remote sensing technology. A satellite image of 99 was taken and uh, uh, then uh, the river channel was drawn. It is shown with the uh, uh, this this particular color, and then again, it, uh, image of 1973 was taken, and the channel was drawn from that. It was superposed on GIS, and then we can see the how much has been the change in a particular direction. Uh, <laughs> this is another example wherein we are monitoring it between 1973 and 2012. And you see that this is around 2.5 kilometers southwestern migration. <laughs> what, is its what is its relevance? The relevance is that if we had constructed one bridge here, sometimes in 1973, that bridge would have remained here only and the river would have migrated here. So in selection of suitable sites for civil engineering projects, whether they are barrages or bridges or uh, alignments of expressways or railways, in the proximity of rivers, we need to consider this, that those segments of the rivers which have witnessed minimum migration over past few years are the best sites for any barrage or bridge. Otherwise, the civil engineering project will go into rough weather. Now, this is the digital elevation model of the same area. And this digital elevation model gives us a detailed know-how about uh, this river valley, which comprises active floodplain and old floodplain of Ganges. And you see, this is confluence of Ganga and Yamuna. This is Yamuna. Yamuna is more entrenched, more entrenched, confined with it within its banks. But Ganga is more or less uh, witnessing more or less successive migration at places. So uh, this is only because of the successive migration of Ganga that Allahabad or Gragra city is witnessing floods for the past five, six or seven years. Now, this is a very important example of confluence dynamics and this is probably one of the most dynamic confluences of our country but one thing is certain this is most dynamic confluence of uttar pradesh this is ganga ram ganga confluence uh, it is in the central up it is in parts of hardoi kannauj sahajapur districts and here uh, again remote sensing gis technologies they have proved to be excellent for monitoring it uh, for monitoring not only bank line shift, but also monitoring the channel level shift, where there has been sudden change in the channel. You see, uh, this is uh, the topo sheet, uh, which is which was downloaded from USGS site because there were no satellites during 1922 23. So, uh, some maybe 100 years old topo sheet. And you see, the confluence was somewhere here at that time. And this confluence has moved to about 13 kilometers upstream. When we took the channels of 2012 uh, through satellite images of that time, this came into uh, light that that is what has happened. Because you see, there has been uh, many of the small streams have been captured in this region, like Kunda River was captured. And now this is what we can see that the confluence migration. So it has not only been bank line here. It has been channel evolution. Bank line shift could be on the right bank or on the left bank. But when the entire channel is migrating either uh, on its right side or left side or upstream, that is channel migration. <clears throat> and if it is suddenly migrating, then it is channel evolution. And you see the channel evolution has been taking place every year during uh, rainy season, particularly during high floods. And uh, it is uh, astonishing to witness that during the period of some 90 years or nine decades between 1923 to 2012 this evolution has been of the order of around 13 kilometers upstream and the result has been a number of villages they have been wiped out they are no more on the map uh, hundreds of hectares land was eroded there has been severe bank erosion and still this uh, Bank line, this channel evolution poses a threat to many more villages. One more important thing is there, uh, this Hajira Bijapur Jagdishpur gas pipeline, it also passes from uh, this, uh, this area. So this pipeline is a very important pipeline which supplies gas from Pombe Basin of Gujarat to 
Mathura refinery. Generally, the gas pipelines they are placed below the surface of earth at a greater depth when they are below river bed and at a shallower depth when they are there is no river above. So what is happening is that because of the migration of Ram Ganga River, uh, particularly in this region, uh, it poses a threat to uh, of erosion to that that gas pipeline as well. So river channel migration study sometimes helps us. Uh, for disaster resilience or for making action plans uh, for uh, safeguarding our infrastructure, including our bridges, railway lines, <laughs> and gas pipelines. Now, assessment of successive migration and channel reversal uh, through mapping and monitoring of uh, earlier courses uh, uh, of uh, rivers. So, uh, you see, uh, there are relic channels, means earlier parts of earlier courses of rivers. If we could map them and we could we could understand their peculiar pattern, uh, their uh, peculiar orientation, then we will be able to infer many things. We might be able to construct paleo drainages. We might be able to uh, delineate the precise boundaries of active and old footprints. And we can infer to some extent uh, the future behavior of the rivers, their future pathways, uh, their future tendencies to migrate in a particular direction, wherein they are going to threaten a particular settlement, industrial area, croplands, forested areas, or any other uh, important uh, <coughs> sites. So, uh, the rally channels is a general, a general terminology which is generally used by civil engineers, but geologists or geographers, they use like uh, the terms like dry channels, they are rally channels. Abundant channels means where river was flowing some times or 20 years back. Uh, then meander scars, they are semicircular, precentric in shape. And uh, then meander scrolls are just old pathways of rivers which are successive one over the other. Uh, they indicate successive migration. Old meander is a very strong indicator of channel evolution in the past. And old meander and oxbow lake are more or less same in the shape. They are uh, semicircular. The, the only difference is oxbow lake will be filled with the water. Old meander is generally not filled. And then the paleo channel is like uh, when uh, there is a, there are a number of old meanders, meander scars making a peculiar pattern. Uh, curvy linear pattern that is a paleo channel, which could be old pathway of a river. So if we can map all these, wherein we can use satellite image, we will be able to map channel migration. How? This is here. Now, <coughs> this is uh, a paleo channel. And this is Ghagra River, which is now named Saryu as well. It is a very important river of Eastern UP, which witnesses floods almost every year. And uh, it's uh, it's catchment uh, uh, means includes many rivers which are emanating from Nepal. They are causing flood havocs in the eastern UP. <laughs> now you see there are very small streams, and some of these streams they are flowing parallel to it. They are called Yazoo streams. Yazoo streams are those streams which are following a master stream, and they are flowing through its active or old floodplains, and they are just flowing parallel or subparallel to master stream for a couple of kilometers, two, three, four kilometers. In rainy season, they become very dangerous when they are filled with water. They can wipe out anything. Then there are some other streams which are called misfits. You see that the, there is very little water into this channel, but the width of the channel is very large as compared to the path of the channel wherein the water is there. So in the past, it might have been a bigger river. <laughs> so this is misfit, but it is paleo channel as well. So this is paleo channel of Gagra River. It is flowing more or less parallel to the <coughs> Gagra River and very small stream is flowing through it. And now you can see there are a number of like uh, oxbow lakes. Some uh, oxbow lakes are here. Some old meanders can also be seen through it. So uh, when we are mapping these paleo channels, uh, even uh, oxbow lakes, old meanders, some meander scars, so we are able to reconstruct the the earlier drainage pattern in this region. <coughs> and uh, here we can see, uh, this is another image, part of, this is Mars image, this panchromatic black and white and colored image is Mars. Again, we can see these paleo channels. Uh, and I think remote sensing technology is the best tool available in the world to map paleo channels, because it is standby 
A paleo channel in the field, we can see it only up to four, five, six hundred meters. But through remote sensing, we can see its entire length and width. We can map it. We can measure it. How much long is it? What is the width? Where there is sinusity? So all these paleo channels, they can be mapped. And not only paleo channels, these uh, indicators of successive migration, meander scars, they can also be mapped. This is how this is how they look on satellite image. Paleo channels, old meanders, or relic channels. So this is how they look in the field. In the field, you see sometimes they are filled with water. Very little water is there, and uh, generally there is a prefix used for paleo channels: bur ghagra, bur ganga. Bur means old. So our ancestors were well, well aware of the fact that they are remnants of uh, large rivers, and sometimes they are filled with water. With the due course time of time, these relic channels are sometimes filled with the silt. And then they look like this. And uh, sometimes they are uh, filled with aquatic weeds and some small patches or pockets of water will be there. Sometimes there will be grasses, but there will be luxuriant growth of grasses as compared to the surrounding because of the high moisture content. In the rainy season, they are filled with water. <coughs> they, these relic channels are excellent sites for groundwater prospecting. If you put a dug well near them, if you put a tube well, uh, the discharge will be very good. The water will be at a shallow depth, but at the same time, these relic channels of rivers or old courses, they are very bad sites for construction, for civil engineering construction, because they will be witnessing water logging every year. So any building constructed there will be submerged because of the water logging. And secondly, they comprise softer soils, all these paleo channels, and the softer soils are something where there is more shaking of due to earthquake waves. So the buildings constructed within these will be more, more prone to earthquakes as compared to the surroundings. So excellent sites for groundwater, but bad sites for construction are these relic channels. Now mapping of bank line shift and channel aversion helps in paleo drainage reconstruction. We can reconstruct the entire paleo drainage of a region. We can demarcate the active and old footprints of rivers. We can have many inputs for fire hazard and monitoring. <laughs> Mapping and monitoring, and some system of tectonic studies uh, can also be carried out uh, by using these inputs of uh, earlier courses of rivers. <coughs> this is paleo drainage reconstruction. We can see here <coughs> that entire paleo drainage is being reconstructed. And we are not only able to construct the paleo drainage, earlier river systems, but also their floodplains to a great extent. They are then active floodplains. <coughs> then Old and active floodplains of present day rivers. You see in yellow color, this is the active floodplain of a river. <coughs> Again, active floodplain of another river. And uh, with the uh, orange color, we can see the old floodplain of the rivers. So, uh, by mapping all these relic channels, paleo channels, old meanders, meanders scarves, we can map these because there will be more frequency of these. Uh, Rally channels within the active floodplain, within the old floodplain, and further we can also see the break in the slope to some extent, even on 2D images, on 3D images it will be very, very clear. So there's slight break of break in the slope at the junction of active and old floodplain, again between at the junction of older floodplain and older alluvium. Now here it is clearer. You can see active floodplain on satellite image. This is this is the junction of active and old floodplain. And within the active floodplain, these fluvial features, they are more frequent, they are more abundant, abundant, and even within the old floodplain, they are more abundant. And as we move on to the older alluvium, they are lesser in their occurrence. <laughs> now for flood mapping as well, we can use these inputs because uh, by mapping the active and old floodplains of all the rivers, uh, we can provide a very crucial input for <coughs> flood hazard donation studies because uh, once we are carrying out the risk mapping we can know the hazard we can know the vulnerability uh, through remote sensing by mapping all the settlements all the industries all the power uh, supply lines power supply lines we can map through lidar and drones along with satellite images and all these uh, this information will uh, help us in uh, knowing the vulnerability of our infrastructure and hazard we can know through uh, by mapping the flood prone areas and hazard known to vulnerabilities and to risk. So risk mapping can also be carried out. And how do we do these things is 
uh, by getting inputs about ground from satellite images, space-based platforms, aerial platforms like uh, aerial photographs and uh, more recently through drones, we can get information about hazard, uh, elements at risk, buildings, habitations, and vulnerability. And then we can combine all these into GIS, and then it helps us in preparing flood hazard maps, and then uh, our decision support system. Now, seismic tectonic studies, they can also be carried out uh, using uh, uh, this uh, information uh, from these rallied channels, because you see if the river, uh, the floodplains of the rivers are broader at certain places, it, and if there are elevated ridges on both the sides, they could be indicators of some of the lineaments, as can be seen in these images. And then this is how they look in the field. They are in the form of elevated ridges, but all these are getting uh, deteriorated with the passage of time because of uh, the supply of soil from these areas to the other areas for construction. But now, uh, anthropogenically induced uh, bank line shift is also there. If you are like in this portion of Himalayas, uh, some hydrogen tunnel is being constructed. So the its uh, waste material it is being submerged into the uh, disposed into the river channel. So it is resulting in the shift of the river channel, and that it is causing toe erosion on the other side. So digital elevation models based on the contour lines and satellite images they can also help us assess exactly where. The toe erosion is taking place, and it, is it because of natural phenomena or due to anthropogenic activity? Now, uh, the decision support modules that we can create through GIS, where in number of layers, whether they are base layers, elevation, geology, land use, and uh, road infrastructure, river stream, and channel migration, all these inputs can be used for flood hazard duration uh, mapping. Now, uh, an example that how bank line shifts or bank erosion channel reversion creates havoc. This is the example. You see, uh, here vulnerability also has a role. The Kedanak flood that took place in 2013, similar flood took place in 1882. But at that time, some one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight to nine huts were around Kedanak temple. So the vulnerability was very low. I think a population of maybe 20, 30 uh, might have been there. Uh, pilgrims might have been there. But in 2013, we have around 100 uh, lodges, restaurants in Kedanak. So the I think uh, it was sad that a population of more than 10,000 was there, or maybe some according to some sources, for 30,000 people were there. So the vulnerability was very high. So because of the high vulnerability, there was more risk and the more damage was done. You see, this is the picture of uh, Kedanath in the uh, late 90s. Now there are available portals for getting information about uh, rivers, about geomorphology, about different aspects of rivers. Uh, so they are RSSUB and ORG dot in. Wherein our website it provides updated information about flood maps. We have a dedicated division of disaster management in our center. A disaster management cell is there. So that uh, prepares maps about floods in Uttar Pradesh. These are available on this website. Then on one website of NRSC, again we can have information about uh, river geomorphology in any state of the India by clicking the name of the state. <laughs> This is how we can get uh, satellite images on Bone Portal. Uh, I would uh, end my uh, this uh, discussion by citing some lines of my poem, which is about geospatial techniques. And uh, this poem was published in Vigyan Pradati. I have planned it myself. And I would, I'm citing a few lines of it that how important remote sensing is. Because remote sensing, GIS, GPS, LIDAR, all these technologies are conjunctively called as geospatial technologies. So I am reciting the poem, Manu Nirmit Upadra Ho, Manu Nirmit Upadra Ho, Ya Ho Antrikshya, Vaya Yaan Ho, Ya Dron Ho, Ya Prati Siliya Bhaum Lida, Ye Sabhi Dete Dharti Ka Gyan Vigyan Aur Vistar, Aap Prasad Kar Sakhe Yadi Hem Ye Dete Gyan Ka Bhanda. Nagar Ho Ya Gaon Ho, Ya Khanan Se Dharti Par Bane Gaon Ho, Khet Ho Ya Khaliyan Ho Ya Ghas Ke Maidan Ho, Talab Nadi Ya Pokar, Ya Ho Van Ya Van Ya Dharo Har, Bhud Asa Ho, Jal Bara Ho Ya Dharti Ka Kata Ho, Kheti Har Ho Ya Usar Ho, Dal Dal Ho Ya Banjar Ho, हर प्रकार की भूमि के चित्र हमें मिल जाते हैं उपग्रह चित्र वाई में चित्र पॉइंट क्लाउड कहलाते हैं पॉइंट क्लाउड हमें लिडार से मिलते हैं कंप्यूटर तकनीकों से विश्लेषित किए जाते हैं चित्र जो जीआईएस है उसके लिए टर्म यूज हुआ है कंप्यूटर तकनीकों या डिजिटल इमेज प्रोसेसिंग की बात कर रहे हैं कंप्यूटर इमेज तक तकनीकों से विश्लेषित किए जाते हैं चित्र अल्प समय में इन चित्रों से बन जाते हैं मानचित्र भौगोलिक सूचना तंत्र से एकीकृत होते हैं मानचित्र 
निर्णय सहाय तंत्र से संजीत होते हैं मानचित्र डिसीजन सपोर्ट सिस्टम भी इन मैप से हमको मिलता है इन तकनीकों से त्रिवीणीय मॉडल भी बन जाते हैं मीन्स थ्री डी इन तकनीकों से त्रिवीणीय मॉडल भी बन जाते हैं जो पृथ्वी की ऊंची और गहरी सतह दर्शाते हैं वास्तविक धरातल छोटे पैमाने पर दिखता है पर मापन में यह सटीक दिखता है मिल जाते अक्षांत देशांतर वैश्विक स्थिति उपग्रह प्रणाली से ये ग्लोबल नेविगेशन सेटेलाइट सिस्टम की बात हो रही है मिल जाते अक्षांश देशांतर वैश्विक स्थिति उपग्रह प्रणाली से सटीक भौगोलिक स्थिति दिखती इस जीएनएसएस बलशाली से कहीं जियो स्पेशल या भूस्थानिक इन तकनीकों को या कहीं अद्भुत विज्ञान की इन तकनीकों को थैंक यू सो मच थैंक्स अलॉ Thank you, uh, Dr. Anirudh, for giving a very thought-provoking and uh, knowledge-induced, rather, uh, you know, context of migrating behavior of rivers, which are very much characteristics of the tropical rivers of South Asia. You know, all these uh, rivers which come suddenly from the Himalayan systems and enter the plain, the entire energy gets dissipated, and they try to migrate. change path and uh, there is a famous case of koshi river mega fan as you were talking about the ganga ramganga confluence but the koshi mega fan you see the koshi river has shifted eastward by more than 150 km i think 180 or something i don't remember exact figure but close to 200 km the river has shifted so such a massive uh, you know Uh, uh migration of rivers are happening so thank you so much uh, if there are any question i would request dipali to uh read out sure sir so one question is which type of satellite data is most suitable for flood hazard mapping uh flood hazard mapping actually it is uh, not about uh, the type of satellite data it is about uh, satellite multi rate satellite data uh we can use optical data but then if there is cloud cover then optical data will have some problem but if we use uh, satellite data of a number of years like at an interval of 5 years or maybe 10 years and then we can uh, also use the topo sheets of century old topo sheets of 1911 14 14 or 20 survey so we can have uh, a comparative assessment on a century scale so if you want to use satellite data we can use any satellite data lisro satellite image lisri satellite image of 2021 then of all those years in which years river has witnessed peak floods so we have to we need to have some literature survey that in in which particular years the river had peak floods and satellite data of those years can be taken if you are taking entire catchment of ganga then suddenly we have to take a, a coarse resolution data maybe vips If we are taking a very small river like Gomti River or uh, maybe Rapti River, then we shall uh, use this for or this three satellite image. So it depends. If you are taking a very big river which has a length of hundreds of kilometers, we need to use coarse resolution data. Uh, where scene size is bigger and resolution is less. If we are using, uh, if we are working on a very small river which is of maybe 50 kilometers length, 100, 200 kilometers length, then we can use this three data or this four data. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir, for answering. Another question is, how can we mitigate meandering? Uh, mitigate meandering. This is, I think, Yaksh Prasen. I will say, <laughs> Yaksh Prasen, when which was asked uh, by Yaksha Pandavas. So, uh, you see, there are certain things which are beyond the control of human beings. <laughs> As I told in the beginning, and uh, which is something taught to us, I think, in the graduation level. that once we were entering the plain areas they are in natural state natural state of cycle of erosion the velocity is less so they start meandering and wherein they form loops on the either side of their banks so uh, we cannot stop meandering but uh, if there is a critical project adjacent to a river uh, then we have to do like digging of channel and alternate channel is carved out there to just deviate the flow of the water but i think the best thing is that we keep our critical infrastructure away from the meandering channels we should not construct any power plant thermal power plant nuclear power plant or any other critical facilities or satellite town 
supply town in the proximity of a meandering channel because ultimately then we will have to take a number of measures for uh, taming the river. So I think uh, the meandering channel need to be viewed in the perspective of the planning of new infrastructure and we should keep away from that side for any critical civil engineering project. Yes, sir. So, thank you. Uh, we are done with our question and answer round. Thank you so much, sir, for joining and sparing your valuable time and sharing the past. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Sir. Thank you, Dr. Arjur. Thank you, sir. So we move to our next uh, distinguished panelist and speaker, uh, Dr. A.L. Haldarji, who is now working as a consultant at NIDM. And uh, uh, topic is also very much relevant to the entire training program on river hazards, that is flood, disaster, and resilience. Resilience, what is very important because the more resilient you are, the less vulnerable you would be to the climatic changes and other shocks. So we are trying to develop resilience, the resilient society, the resilient ecosystem, and the resilient uh, economy also. So uh, may I request uh, the party to uh, speak a few words about uh, Dr. A.L. Haldarji. Sure, thank you. Uh, Dr. Amrit Lal Haldar, he obtained his post-graduation degree in exploration geophysics from Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur in 1985. He completed his PhD degree from Vikram University of Jain, Madhya Pradesh in the uh, year 2003, which had pursued during the job. After passing out of IIT Kharagpur, he served as Danish International Development in uh, served in Danish International Project, Government of Orissa, Bhubaneswar as geophysicist from 1985 to 1988. He performed massive groundwater exploration of freshwater in the coastal area of Orissa. Thereafter, he joined Remote Sensing Application Center, UP Lucknow, as Scientist SC and elevated up to Scientist SG. Worked on geophysical exploration for groundwater on Hard Rock area of Bundelkhand as well as alluvial area of entire Uttar Pradesh, remote sensing, GIS, and DGPS, LIDAR, and bathymetry. 37 projects is sponsored by state, central government, internationally also were completed during the ten, uh, tenure of the Remote Sensing Application Center. Uh, he was appointed as Director of Remote Sensing Application Center with the British for a duration of two years and got superannuated in March 2020. Presently, as uh, Professor Datta mentioned, he is working as a consultant at the Flood Monitoring Cell at uh, National Institute of Disaster Management, Delhi. To the credit, he had 67 technical paper in international and national general and symposium, and he visited uh, several countries like France, Italy, and Switzerland for the technical program. So with these words, I invite Dr. Amritlal Haldar to kindly take over the stage. Over to you, sir. Okay, thank you, Dipali. Thank you very much for your appreciation and the introduction to the uh, audience. Now I can see you. Is it visible? Yes, sir, it is visible. Kindly put the uh, put on slideshow. Yes, yes sir. I hope it is in your So, so in this topic, as you, Dr. Uh, Professor, Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul, yeah, it's not a disaster, not a disaster. Just one second, please. You see the sunset. That slide has come. Just one second, please. Now, this is some uh, different slide has come for some other topics. So please.
Dear participants, we will begin shortly. Uh, just some some technical glitches there. He's about to share his presentation. Kindly wait. Yes, uh, I hope people are clear. Yes, sir, your screen is visible, sir. And uh, the screen is visible, and my voice is also audible. Okay. So, your voice is uh, audible, but uh, some it is cracking a little bit. Okay, okay. I will try to put some space on that. Now, the topic is uh, it is the focus on that. Uh, special for resilience, resilience and initially I am showing some uh, part, of, uh, part of examples that what happens in 2021 and 2020. Illnesses will be given uh, say for the last few years. So you know that uh, in this 2021 how the flood theory is given the losses and uh, distress to the people. Say, in the uh, from the month of February, what we have learned, what we have listened from uh, Professor Dutta and Dr. Uh, Sridharish or India, right? That has happened to the Sutrakhan, say, in the first week of February. There, the flood is coming one by one. After that, in the, during the month of May, uh, yes has given the tremendous shock and tremendous problem and a lot of destruction in Isha and Bengal, especially in Bengal, that a lot of things which have been submerged, of course, the death is less because uh, of warning uh, uh, from the government side and scientists have given an early warning how the special for the cyclone is very effective. And losses have been reduced, but still, it been submerged, especially the first spot in Denver, is Denver Beach. That was, their speed speed was more than a year about 100 km per hour. And uh, the, the waves was been reaching, say, just coconut trees and abundant in that coastal bed. They are the top of the coastal bed. It weighs more than uh, 78 meter somewhere, it is possible. And the, all the roads is being flooded, and east of the passes and east of the water, we have to be that area just in summer. That, uh, you know that uh, Antifal was there in Odisha, we had Padra, but still in that uh, eastern coast from Padra uh, to Bangladesh, to in Africa, especially in Bengal, that is in uh, West Midnapur, East Midnapur. And this whole Parvana and Nadia, and also, that has been suffered. And the flood has taken place since that point. After that, also, several low depressions are created in Bengal. Continuously, floods are there, not only in Bengal. So, in the month of this uh, October, it has reached to the Kerala also. And you know that uh, in this uh, October, that even uh, this flood was there in Uttarakhand also. So, so in India, you know that uh, potential of the million is 329 million hectares. Now, more than 30 million hectares are flood flowing. Causes, we have a concern that is damages and swaying. Year for year, it is, uh, it is increasing. It means the trend is increasing. Now, earlier, within the uh, average annual flood damage during last year, year at present, it was 5,000 crore or more. Compared to earlier, what has taken that 50 years in average, that is per year, it was 2,000 crore. 
It means that how the flood, the quantum and frequency are increased, and how it is giving the problem, especially in India. Of course, it is not just in India, it is in other countries also here. In India, more than 27, uh, out of 27 states and six Indian territories, more than, say, 18 states of flood flood, and floods are taking time to come. So, during 2021, as I told you, that uh, several releases uh, are already highlighted, especially in London, the Asimu Park, where the 83 bodies and 36 human bodies parts were recovered. Out of list of the lot of people are missing, especially in the path land. And in that, Intensive chapter schools and major disasters because school that may be the causes of the high avalanche and large rock spaces that may be the causes. You see the dreams of that like the cyclone but was the focus center and the landfall in the Hadra in the eastern coast of Asia. And the rural states, especially northeastern of India, eastern and northern, northwestern, but of course now it is here in northeastern states, but not that much in the land field, state, but it is there in south. In comparison to last year, the south in that uh, it is, but still it is there, especially in, this, in the month of October. And however, at uh, the program is uh, within this year, that is, these are the states which have been affected, especially Uttarakhand, West Bengal, Maharashtra, and eastern part of it. As Professor Dr. Kohl, and one means is within the first out. Kerala and Maharashtra, what is happening in Mumbai? And especially from the last place, the teaching place in Mumbai, in Kerala also, and getting. Day by day, and frequency is increasing. In this month, September 21, 15th, the incessant rain was there in residents and cut off from the various parts of the coastal state. Was what worst affected area was the Pram, the Duki, where the received in one day, so this one four millimeter, that is. Uh, 3.5 millimeter looking at the Kotaya one day. Now, how impact the given that area, especially in the south and for the flood? That's what matters. As per the only incident, the seventh warning, the Indian trigger and landslide has taken place. There are also a lot of casualty happened. Of course, in Kerala, these are the last since 2018. 2018 was very common, 2019 and 2020 also. And finally, 21, the month of Kerala, in Kerala, this landslide has taken place. And in this year, the 26 people have already died. Of course, it may be more, but so far, it's not the present news. In Assam, we know. What the aim, especially in the left hand side, that is, uh, floods, is the floods, uh, especially from the Bhutan, uh, there are a lot of them in uh, 56 river flowing from the Himalaya to the western western part of the Asin. This side, you see, it is coming, especially from the Bhutan, the river here. It was a unitarian, means that a lot of them are there, and it is adding to India. Some it is quite a flat study. Similarly, to the right hand side, that is the eastern part, by the Brahmaputra and some main is Brahmaputra and its tributaries. So, other rivers, like Devan, Bahi, Subarnasi, which are going from Tibet landscape in the eastern part of Assam, and it is creating the flood in India also. So, these are the main factors that why Assam is very much flat year by year. A significant flood taking place during the 2003, 8, 12, and 14, and 15. Of course, each year, one or other 
Pakistan's war in Assam, the great government, but these are the years that significant flag taken place and lot of casualty. We are to my growing what happened during the 2008. But you see the what he was highlighting with the uh, predecessors. Then, uh, 2008, what was the specific procedure and how Professor Rafa de Kuhn and the shifting specific from the migration data to more than 100 people. So, yeah. And if you see that, now they are there, no images are there, but still, you can correlate with the height more than 100 kilometers where shifted that region. So, what a geologic situation. Geometric features of importance here is near you see. Now, this river is crossing, it is coming from the mountain, it is coming from the metal, and a few days are there. There are 20 in the last moving to the 2020, that was the plan was there, and the statistics were that 27 categories are there, and more than 550,000 people are evaporate, and none of other casualties in Bihar. Like 2008, some other years are also there. You can see that 2013, civil flag taken place, 2000, 2002, and 2016. And if you see the gist of the floods in the year, one by one, the later floods have been tabulated in Assam in 2000, 2003, and this you can see the recent, most recent, and the heavy rainfall. As well, it is happening. So in 2000, it was 121 meter there, it's not reported. And in 2015, of course, it was this. And how much people population has been affected? That is there in this property that is also. In 2013, nearly it was nobody knows because none of persons are missing it could be placed. So far, more than 4,000 meters. Majority are gone. And then, uh, yeah, some people say, what I feel, the uh, standards are mostly there, missing still. Kerala, you have seen the as I told you, 2018, 2019, that landslide has been placed, and 2019, more than 121 persons have died. So far, at that time, there were seven persons are missing. Bengal, these are the gist of that in the past 20 years, what is a significant past taking place in India. The Kerala, the scenario in 2019, and this was this was a one part of the plan. Kerala, more than two that were affected, the city, the landslide taking place, all are due to that. Last lab news that he did in certain families, suddenly. And during June, if you see in Kerala, that was June, the rainfall was there, 649 millimeters. So rainfall was supposed to be, that average rainfall was 749 millimeters. Whereas in the month of June, it was taken place 649. And similarly, that month in July, it was at 726. And that was happened between first to 19th, again in the month of August, it means that is 1639 millimeter rainfall taken place in the Kerala by the present two thousand eight against the against the bottom uh, the rainfall was uh, say two, two, four, six. It means the past in the region, if you see. That was in the month of June, plus 15 percent, and 19 to past 19 August, the departure was 164 percent. As it was flood, uh, rain, rainfall was at 287, whereas it was uh, the normal rain was 27, whereas actually it was taken by 7 people. So it means that 164 percent reduction. So this has given the impact uh, in that region as a landslide and flood. So what I told you about the Munna is very sensitive place, specifically for the uh, landslide, and that is the beautiful place nowadays for the tea. That is a tea growing at this time is there, and this is going on. Everybody, it 
was the same law in the sensitive amount that we have to the answer. In Mumbai, what you know that in 2020, there was so much money to produce. For this, I don't know that, that nowadays that this computation is going on and all the flags remain, the flags remain and all the damages are being blocked and construction are going on. This was the incorrect ethic of the direct asset you can see for the flag. No damage are blocked. Even the boundaries are there. Even the flag, the flag. But what was impounded within the boundary? So that's why it takes a few days to receive the water in that city. So it was common in Mumbai, some other city also. And all these are happening. And of course, that gives me to say the climate change. So this climate change is one of the major factors of this last flood. The statistics in 2018, 10th July. So these are the cities are called here in a day. To like 50 millimeter rainfall was there. That was in Oregon. Similarly, 218 millimeter was there. It means that how the flood intensity and the rainfall intensity has been increased day by day. Now, now, onwards, 2005 onwards, it is there. And you see that uh, scenario the public and the people to carry with the platform. Can be rescued, but course, uh, manage the people, save the people, and So, a lot of things are depending on climate change. You know, this ocean gas, also the ocean gas, and this carbon dioxide, and this cutting um, of trees, these are the major causes, but it's increasing the temperature in the atmosphere table. So, already some panel is there. But uh, for reducing the uh, one what being despite this 2100 here, that we should reduce, if not for it to be by two degrees at the end, this one or one point five degrees in this one, or else it will be facing the severe challenge. Say, all the pressure will be uh, in the melting, if not only some part. Happens on the sea water will be increasing. Beside the sea, a lot of people are in the residents are there who are responsible to produce a lot of foods that are for India. They will pass for that, a lot of light will be lost because that they are residing in the that area, so it will be putting submerged on this amazing temperature. It is good at the disasters. Especially for the poor, poor people, day by day, and especially in these disasters, the most they victimize, and not only poor, but other persons, they are also victims this disaster. Now, by some means, it means that we can, uh, we can reduce the carbon dioxide emission for our country, that planning for that, we have to reduce, or else we take the severe loss that. Uh, all the phenomena, plus phenomena is going to be happening. It's a big level of So this way, in, in 2016 in Bihar, what happened? That was the less rainfall. It means the red color, it was the minus. It means in that year, mostly the northern part of Bihar, not only in the central part, it was what was. And similarly, even in the other, that is 2017, you see the spikes blue color, that the uh, rain, excess rainfall. So, pupils, that too less, too much less rain and uh, excess rain, go over so, sorrows and boom, not boom, reasonable condition for the. So, they thought during the 2017 that they may, it may happen the same uh, repetition of 2016, but it is not, but no, it is not drop, but the over. I mean, the rainfall has given the swallow, it means again destruction in the uh, So, this was the scenario in that 2017. I'm not going to mention that already it has been talked that uh, in 2013, 
radical global spark on the Kedarnath phenomena was happening in Jurabari Glacier, that was vast and it was uh, the sealed water, the glacier melted water that has given the fury in that region. Of course, the temple to save, but in that region, the standard tourists they have been passed out in that area. So that was a great loss in, in, in that region. The initial part to that by few respect was there, but we can say that day by day is increasing on the thing on the issues that were the burning issues in Paragon, especially in the slope, because the land is a very much seismic zone, the seismic zone zone. Think how the plant plant to be managed or where to be planted. The rivers in that, in that region, the rivers are coming from that hill. That is getting blocked due to the plants like debris. That has to be removed. I to take audience to be lost of spilling and so what was the origin in 2000? 13 that flood means that uh, tragedy. You know, there was cyclic circulation. It was developed in the low pressure area in the Bay of Bengal. And it moves towards westerly, rapidly intensified the moisture and the moisture supply was from the Bay of Bengal, Arabian Sea, also. And it has added the western disturbance which has caused the phenomena. It means that uh, flash flood is in place in that Trokoyal, Chamoli, in one of the total seven districts were affected, whether um, the total district was affected. But in that glacier that was in the height of 3,800 meters, these floods that affect the Slavic glacier. It has been fasted and it has affected not only Uttarakhand, the Natural Pradesh, and in part of the Nepal, other places that affect shortage between the cyclic circulation that has affected such as the flash flood in this region. Now, in the Tamil Nadu, what happened in 2015? That was the cause of the again flash flood. The havocs are there. I'm not going to details of that. Even the sun scenarios are here. In Chennai, that was received 1049 millimeters, it was 41 inches rainfall in one day. That was the 15 double. And that was caused, that was the end of that uh, southeast monsoon, the beginning of the uh, northeast monsoon. In the, in the transition zone, in both are ahead of the year, it means that uh, moisture rainfall has taken place. And which has put in pretty severe um, scenario of phenomena in the history of India. See the statistics of rainfall in Chennai, see the scenario in the place. You know what is flat? <clears throat> there is a high flow which overtakes the natural channel provided for the runoff. Flat generally takes place. Area which is more dry, suddenly the water comes from the nearby area or from the rain. Because happened, it means that in the dry area, when it's submerging and that to great quantity, then flood takes place. The flood is any relatively high steam flow naturally, and what of the natural artificial banks? We know that flood is not a purely hygienical lesson, notion, but a geomorphological and water management. Causes, we should know, the high intensity rainfall is the major cause, meandering and process of river. But Dr. Leon was telling that this meandering and this uh, meandering, not if the rivers are meandering, especially in the eastern UP, that happens. All the rivers, maximum rivers are meandering each other. In that process, it is taking place. And the meandering, even sometimes it was happening, erosion was taking place. And then the boundaries, says uh, somewhere that in the riverside, one side, the Mr. Gandhi, after 
the flat it was changing the location and similarly for the channel gradient if the sudden change here the flat takes place and different different valley and channels instead of different valley and channels the flat takes place but from the natural causes some anthropogenic causes are also there you can see uh, building activity and eventual urbanization the eventual urbanization is giving the major causes so what is happening in mumbai what is happening in other cities say kolkata and even in delhi also of course uh, but this year in delhi more than 1500 million to 1501 million to in politics it means it's a record in the 121 years that was the rainfall record in subdivision and of course it is managed it was not flooded well managed these are all the things but of course water logs are there these are happening because this water log and this flooding in especially metro cities is happening to the anthropogenic causes here no deforestation is there and rules are changes channel manipulation to diversion of channels process these are there so due to this thing that it is happening in the metros so these are the different stages of flood so when the flood takes place then we have to think for the relief there are the rehabilitation then reconstruction of the area mitigation from the before flood you have to be preparedness and when the disaster happened after that really the other things will be there so this was the scenario of the flood so i'm not going to like a colonial told about the remote sensing and gis what we will do in the channel evolution the same things same phenomena in the same way uh, the, you can you can use the remote sensing and gis for uh, as a tool how to prepare the flood hazard zone and you know that in the very interior places that very people cannot go immediately that is a remote sensing technology it gives the immense information and it can guide the how the people or how the point of relief could be reached which place the uh, MDRA or SDR part uh, should reach the remote sensing technology and the separate data that can give immediate information is remote sensing because and you know it's going to be synoptic and coverage and real time information is flooding in these areas river process channels and spill channels are mapping nicely precise real time because of the bias so this was the optical the satellite data one area so what you should do in free flood you should prepare the inventory flood plain assessment you should obviously if you have been flood plain assessment it means that it should be free for the uh, for the so that no flood takes place but unfortunately we are not in that condition that's why it is happening and also you should think for the flood routing if flood routing will not be there then the days could have been months to be the flood water will be stuck up. Here in the pre field flood region, we should think of the flood routing. Flood weather generation map, we should prepare. Flood mitigation map also, we should prepare. During flood, what we will do? Flood inundation, flood extent, we have to map because at that time, during the flood, we cannot get the uh, optical data, we have to depend on the uh, and obviously, India is very much uh, independent to have this type of data. We have to know the status of critical facilities so that we can transfer the public to the media. I could know history, they can be shifted from very safe. And we have to ask, uh, assess the route of transportation. Assess the crop, quality damages, and assessment of stuff. These are the things. So you know that during 1998, what happened in Gorakhpur and Maharaj Say in the month of August, 
So second August, the flood starts. During the incessant rain, more than seven these dams, reservoirs, have been broken. Flood water being pumped in. That was due to the uh, less of the proper drainage. It means the village was so congested, it could not, I mean, the flood water could not be accepted or could not be managed properly. That's why the water and drain are routing should be uh, there, but all the drainage congestion could be removed. So that this type of thing said once together it was there the water in the work to Faraj Banj. So this was the rather set data in this Rapti in Khagra Vizar. So you see this was the work to and Maharaj Banj is the Rapti and Devriya district is there. The river is there. So this putting black colors to see the uh, how much quantity of area it was being inundated. This river also in Kamdhari. This was the sequential monitoring. It means if you see the green color, that was the inundation of the green color, that was the inundation to the unknown thaw. And red color, that was on the 38th. Of course, the green color was there, red, but it uh, showed to mark it. The winter it was shown. You see that from 3rd August, 30th August, how much and property of all the crops being damaged, how much loss was there. This was the village boundary that Maharaj Ganj and Gorakhpur district. So, how many villages were inundated to can count? That was the due to the facility of GIS. So, I'm not going to this. So these are the things which are needed to prepare the database for the flood so that you can manage to the flood on the things. Now, what you will do and what you will not, you should not do. Those and don't do. Those you should think the safety first yourself and for the family and for them for the public others. Take care and walking through the shallow, shallow water. And you should be you should only go to the walk in the shallow water. That too should be possible. During that time, all the electricity appliances and gas supply should be stopped and even must be also. You should not do what should not be done. Don't, don't try to walk or drive through the flood water. You should not plant water, but wherever it is there, you should not do anything except that you should to see that. Don't walk across the bridge because the bridges are so. Uh, and it may go to the new one also, but you still have a chance to cross the because it will pass. We were swimming in this fast flowing water, avoid contact of, uh, with the flood water as it may be. Because in major, you should take before and during flood, your family members should know the safe route, the nearest center. They should be, however, if not in the local media, radio, TV, they should put it on, they should follow. I still think that guys nowadays, that much only what you want that one is developed by the people in that area. So, it's here, it is here, it is another person's type of place. So, much it's a kit, should be with you. I could keep some dry food, if you got that, I guess. These are the things the daily plant should be at least. To somehow safe. Your home surroundings would be filled with water so that some sandbags should be ready to seal your entry point so that the flood water does not go inside. Do not allow the children, women, pregnant women, women, and this to mark. So that will cause some other happens. Now you know the snakes are very much abundant in the flood, so you should be avoid. To for the snake bites. So these are the certain things. Now I should tell about the road safety. While driving, you should go very, very slow and fast gear. And you should put the headlights on so that others could be spotted. And if some misappearing there, is there a there a army with a big clear, then we can do something. Similarly, in uh, that. Keep a hammer close to the treasure so that if, if any uh, other 
things is happening, then the head rest of the car of the vehicle damaged and can go. So that's why hammer is needed the vehicle in that height. So these are the how we prepare the plot this map. Yes. Uh, we are running out of time, sir. So kindly I'll please I'll finish again only two, three minutes of the so I was uh, discussing was there in the front of this choice and nothing. The segment data, you know, other ancillary data, data, say geopolitical boundary, road network, these are in repair. And the it was GIS, you can repair the plant distribution for the uh, purpose of the administrative people. So in satellite, you know, the reversions can be there are a lot of problems as you can see also if these are there. Now, to come to the prevention, you know that the prevention is better than cure. It means that preparedness should be taken place. The prevention is the activity to reduce blood risk and it will promote appropriate land use, agriculture, land management, forest management. These are the things um, you should be able to measure within these ways. You should be aware to promote local residents of blood risk and appropriate action in the event of emergency is there. So how the flood risk could be reduced? You have to produce better flood warning system that is very required. India you could day by day, modify your homes and business in the stand of the floods, start buildings from flood levels, tackle climate change. Increases in spending of flood defenses, and we should protect white lands because they are also to some extent the people relief to the flood to absorb or to store in the water. Now, how does the audience to do the flood damage? Clean out, to gives uh, gives tasks and bounce bounce out. It does not take much water to produce localized flooding. For this, if dams and reservoirs can help, you know, expensive harvesting and reinforce your roof. It means that you have to take precaution on your own building. Purchase, you should be aware, you should be taken the flood insurance also. So, now what is the flood resilience? But it is a term. That has become more commonly used and generally means the damages are minimized during the flood times. It means that you have to do such a way like a certain technology that flood damages could be minimized. So that is the resilience. And, and what is resilience? Potential flood to improve a home's protection from flood loss. This is the program. Offers resident uh, residency protection and flood event. This optional coverage allows the homemakers to repair structure in flood resistant material and such as water resistant trial. So these are the things for the resilience of the same and for the so district and of the state. How can flood resistant resilience be increased? The individual property owners can take their own steps to increase their flood resilience. Building owners can employ such methods as increasing the building elevation. The building should be elevated day by day and constructing these levees. These levees are repaired so that some flood protection takes place and getting water diversion as advantage. Similarly, similar, these are the things, these are three points are there for the building resilience. We can read out. Now, to minimize the flood, there are certain measures are there, that is the structural measure and non structural measure. Especially the structural measure, the reservoirs, say to West Bengal, that Kamakas helicopters can damage them. It is a quite uh, set up in British Bureau and it is controlling by day by day. This year, West Bengal, there was rainfall also, but still, it is. Some of the Jelly Corporation has reservoirs and they are, they are managing, they are absorbing, and during the, the peak flood is there, so they are storing, uh, storing the reservoirs, and after some time they are releasing, I mean, uh, 
these are the simple ones because uh, same thing is here in Okaidia in Gujarat it is there and detention basin our times should be there because wherever the repressions are there the detention basins we made in those areas give off or eradicate the flood in those similar the environments where there was environment should there that should be extended the UP that the ministry is very much aware of that environments so they are very much vigilant and not a single environment should be broken in such a way they are you know vigilant that they are picking here and also this channel is a river a lot of parts of their terminal channelization you can minimize and somewhat uh, that you know, boom somewhere is the bell somewhere the channelization I heard that a little stagnant is there that it will create a problem but and with no I am so one figure. See. So you see this now, the channel is no way. You see the left hand side, how it mismanages the channels. Now if we channelize in one way that that will be uh, minimized and it will pass I see. Similar other points are there, but which are I positive in the brain. And certain non-structural approaches are there. These are the India is highlighting because you cannot reduce the, you cannot stop the rainfall, what is happening. But this non structural approach can minimize the flood. That is the flood plane zoning, you should do flood forecasting, that should be done. And, and this forecasting should be transmitted in time. And this reservoir operation, you should maintain integrated reservoir operation, you should integrate it in the reservoir operation. Should be done. That is safety. Uh, emergency action plan to so, study that uh, NRC Sri uh, Lakshmi he has highlighted the emergency as some action plan for emergency action plan he goes a lot of things for that and the use of this space technology is very emotional and trace other technology is very much useful for the non-structural you can find it you can minimize it and mitigate the problem similarly for the adherence of coastal geodegradation Now that's all from my side. Now we should think for the resilience, especially for building the area and all those drainage should be thoroughly managed so that no obstruction, no debris should be there in the hill. If no, at least it should be moderate and so that flood water or other water will pass through. We should think in the global warming. Then in that we can be. India can be resilient but it's hard to be mitigated. Now, this is, now uh, thank you very much for your peaceful theory. What is the point? Uh, you can go. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful lecture, for giving uh, the background of various types of floods and cause and how we could prepare the flood zoning map. So if there are any questions, uh, Deepali could read out. Sure, sir. There is one question. What is the reason of recent flash flood in metro city like Delhi, Gurgaon, and Mumbai? And how can we mitigate this? See that uh, this flash floods are the causes. You know that uh, this warming, this global warming is happening. Now, what is temperature? If it is raising, so point five degree centigrade. Only point five degree. Then what is happening? That extra moisture put in the cloud, it will be three percent more. Now, each day by day, the temperature is increasing. Obviously, the global warming is there. Now we see the three percent increase in this moisture within the cloud. Now that will give definitely some impact. In the especially it is giving definitely the rain, but the flash flood, especially in the few in those areas with the concrete emission and the development of the in this plant plane and say the very a lot of in uh, in dull dull case of the channel that flood water is not is not getting reduced. And even those boundaries, boundary walls, they are not allowing the plant this water to slow smoothly. That is another thing. But of course the flood routing it means 
email. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Halda, for your interesting talk. So we had a very fruitful day today. Three lectures, starting from earthquake and the seismic hazards to the bank erosion and the flood zone mapping. So I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow, which is the last day of the training program. We'll have three uh, uh, very informative lectures. Uh, so so see you tomorrow. Thank you so much to uh, everyone, including uh, our Professor Sir Prakash Ji, uh, Dr. Haldar Ji, and all the team from NIDM for hosting this. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor thank you, Sir, for moderating the session. I request the participants to kindly be there for the last day of our training session, that is tomorrow. And please use the same link uh, from which uh, you have been joining us from past two days, including today and the last day. So thank you so much. Stay positive, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sharp. Nicely conducting the session. And of course, little time is more, but I can. The material part, at least that uh, is certainly uh, should be benefited. Just, uh, right. But I hope that everything will improve. Tomorrow again, we will meet at the same time. Sure, sir. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And in case if anything is missed by the participants, uh, these sessions are on YouTube also. You can go and check out the YouTube videos for the same. Thank you so much. Thank you.